heat waves, drought, tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, blizzards, bitter cold. Extreme weather has an incredible impact on people across the globe. On Mount Washington, our scientists brave some of the worst weather on the planet to improve our understanding of our warming world. Good evening and welcome everyone to Mount Washington Observatory's Science in the Mountain series with program support from MathWorks. How is everyone doing this evening? Thanks so much for joining. My name is Brian Fitzgerald and I'm the Director of Science and Education here at Mount Washington Observatory. And joining us this evening to discuss uh, not only one, but two long-term visibility records in New England are Mount Washington Observatory weather observer Jay Brocklow and Blue Hill Observatory Chief Scientist Mike Iacono. So thanks again for joining us for tonight's program. For those of you who aren't already familiar, the Mount Washington Observatory is a private nonprofit member supported organization whose mission is to advance the understanding of the forces that create Earth's weather and climate. And we accomplish that through operating a summit weather station with around the clock weather observation and forecasting by conducting research and product testing projects and by developing and offering innovative educational programs. If you have questions for tonight's speakers and are joining us via Zoom tonight, make sure you use the Q&A button, which you can find right down at the bottom of your toolbar in the center portion of your Zoom screen there. You can ask questions throughout the program. We'll be collecting them throughout the entire program tonight, uh, but we will save time specifically for the end of the program to do a live Q&A session. So make sure you get your questions in whenever they come up. Now, if you're joining us on the live stream this evening, welcome. Thanks so much for being with us. Uh, while we won't be able to respond to all of your questions uh, in real time throughout the program, our summit staff will try and respond as quickly as they can uh, following this program this evening. Uh, if you'd like to connect with us through Zoom for the next program, make sure you register at mountwashington.org slash SITM. All righty. Well, before we introduce our speakers for this evening, I will introduce a poll to all of you joining on Zoom. So I'll launch that right now. If you're on Zoom, you'll see some poll questions that have just popped up. We'd love for you to participate. Uh, just four questions for you tonight. The first one being, we'd love to know where you're joining from tonight. Lots of folks joining from all over the country, usually for our programs, love to know which region of the country you're joining from, or perhaps from outside the country as well. Curious how many of you are currently members of the observatory or perhaps aspiring members, love to know that. And then a couple trivia questions for tonight's program. The first being, what is the furthest reportable visibility from the summit of Mount Washington? I believe our speaker, Jay Broccolo, will be covering that. And then a nice trivia question uh, via Mike Icano. What is the instrument used at Blue Hill Observatory to observe sunshine duration? Mike will touch on the sunshine measurement as well at Blue Hill tonight. So be it a Campbell Stokes recorder, a, oh, I'm gonna pronounce some of these probably poorly, but a nephoscope, an ombroscope, a uh, pihelometer. Pi oh, I should have practiced that one before. It could be any one of these. So get your, uh, your best guesses in here. See already quite a few of you participating and I'll give you just another 10 seconds or so to get your responses in. All righty, in three, two, one, and we'll end the polling. We'll share some results with everyone. Look at that, overwhelmingly, the Northeast being represented for tonight's program, but we have some good representation of scattering throughout the rest of the country as well. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Uh, for current members, well, the majority of you are members currently, and we thank you very much for your continuing support. And for all of you who are considering becoming a member as well, encourage you to do that uh, to support free programs like this one over at mountwashington.org. You click on the upper right-hand corner of the homepage there, and you can become a member or even donate to support programs uh, like this one. All right, on to the trivia questions. It looks like most of you went with 130 miles for the maximum reportable visibility. We'll see what Jay has to say about that. And then, oh, you had to pick the, the instrument that I couldn't pronounce here. 
Well, you picked the last one there that starts with the PY. Uh, we'll see if that's the instrument that measures uh, sunshine here. We'll, we'll hear how uh, Mike pronounces that as well. So I will stop sharing there. And why don't we move on to tonight's speakers? I would love to introduce first up uh, weather observer and currently on the summit right now on shift, taking some time out of his uh, long day, his long shift that he's already ended, uh, is Jay Brocklow on the summit. Jay, would love for you to take it away. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you great, Brian. Great, and I can see and hear you just fine. So why don't you take it away? Yeah, great, I will. Um, so as introduced, this is me, Jay Brocklow. I am a weather observer and meteorologist here at the Mount Washington Observatory. And uh, without further ado, let's, uh, let's get right into it. All right, so the outline of our presentation today, I'm gonna to give a brief introduction of the observatory, the history, go over what we measure, go over how we measure uh, visibility, and really get into the motivation, the objectives, and the scope of work of this project. Um, we'll go through the data sets that we use, prevailing visibility and lowest visibility. Uh, they are two separate things. Um, and then we'll go through the charts, the pretty pictures with all the pretty colors uh, that you really wanna see. And then we'll end on a future work where we would like to go with this and then I'll kick it off um, to Mike. All right, so a little history about the observatory. Uh, the observatory started in 1932 by the observatory four founders. Uh, it was mostly funded by a research grant and a handful of donors. And as stated before, we are a private nonprofit supported by our members and the folks like all of you watching this program. So now, what do we measure? Now, I realize that this is going to be kind of hard to see, but it's kind of hard for us to see, too, because this is about 78 years old. So if we go into it, we can see the still original handwriting, but what is on this sheet? We have temperature, precipitation type, timing, cloud cover, sunshine time, wind speed, and direction, snowfall, and depth, summary of day. Um, one interesting fact to see on here, I like to just show you to this little spot right here. And if you can read that, on this day, June 15th in 1943, there were thunderstorms at 443 and history has repeated itself. Anyway, moving on. So this is another sheet, which is recording station pressure, uh, dry and wet bulb temperatures, which we use to then get the dew point and relative humidity. Um, we record our max and min temperature, tip, uh, max and min temperatures with precipitation and again, wind speed direction and the state of the weather, which is given by a weather code, which again, you can't see, but we know what those codes are and so does the National Weather Service. This is what it looks like today. This is how we enter our observations today. And as you can see, horizontal visibility is our prevailing visibility. And then in all these other sections, we record our other like present weather, sky condition, our cloud cover, and our precipitation, cloud height, and again, visibility with a set of codes um, that again, all get distributed to the National Weather Service and that we use internally. Now, what we measure is recording visibility regarding this project. So right now, this view is from our observation tower. And if you look about right here, this is where we usually stand. Um, to view the uh, visibility and all the weather that happens. So starting in the early 40s, it was kind of on the east side of the mountain, but obviously the summit of the mountain is very small, so it's very relatively speaking. However, now that we are on the west side of the mountain, it is easier for us to see towards the west um, without walking around the summit. Um, but this is a view to the northeast, and this is the sunrise. Very pretty picture. Okay, so how we measure visibility. Now, from the summit of Mount Washington, a lot of you people answered 130 miles, and you would be correct. We can see 130 miles uh, from the summit of Mount Washington, and that's because of our elevation. We, can, we are high in the atmosphere, 6,288 feet. And if you look along these little concentric red rings, you can look out to White Face Mountain and Mount Marcy. Mount Marcy is 131 miles, and a lot of the times we can see it's it's, uh, it's silhouette. So if we come in to the room and then go to the next picture, we use these maps. Now these are kind of hard to see, but we have these printed um, above our weather desk 
And these are made from the USGS and we find these at peakfinder.org, which anyone can see. And you can go look at these too. Um, but we have these printed above our weather desk and these have the miles and the topography that we use to judge visibility. That was to the north and this is to the south, which again, you can't see the numbers, but you can get a sense of uh, what we get to look at. So as before, I said that we could see 130 miles uh, to the west, and this is what it looks like to the west. So this is what we see. We're looking for these little silhouettes. Camel's hump, 79 miles, not that far. Whiteface Mountain, 129 miles. Now we're getting a little farther right here. That's really hard to see. You can really only see that on really clear days. Um, but anyway, this is what it looks like for us. And here is the answer to that question. Mount Washington Summit allows for a maximum clear sky visibility of 130 miles. Okay, so what's the motivation of this project? Why did we wanna look at visibility? Um, it's not something a lot of people think about, whether you're in the Smoky Mountains or um, wherever, you really need long distances. Obviously, if you're at an airport, it's important. Um, or if you're on the top of a summit or if you're on a really tall building, those are the only times you really think about visibility or maybe if you're staring out into the ocean. Um, but the North uh, East is kind of referred to as the tailpipe of America. <laughs> and that's because our predominant wind directions are West and Northwest. And what this does is transport all the aerosols in particular matter across the continental US into our direction. Um, this project was born out of curiosity Really regarding changes during the COVID um, pandemic, there was a lot of um, water clearing and visibility, short-term visibility clearings uh, that were seen. And people really wanted to see, well, what was Mount Washington experiencing? Um, and also in communications with the Blue Hill Observatory, which you will learn about in a little bit, um, we've had communications with them where their visibility um, was changing. So what's going on here? Let's get into that. All right, so the objectives, we're gonna explore our manual hourly prevailing visibility from 1943 to the present and see if there are any trends or anomalies, what's going on, if there are any temporal patterns, could these serve to be tools for uh, future studies, uh, possible relationships between visibility and air quality. Um, and then we produced a public document that you can find on our website that summarized the methods and our results. So the scope of work, what, what did we do? Um, well, we first queried all of our data. Um, what was available to us? What type of visibility data do we have that we can use? Um, what's the metadata that goes in with that? Uh, what are the maps that we use to judge visibility? Uh, what are the standing operating procedures that we use? Uh, where are they documented? Uh, when were they documented? Then we'll get into the time series analysis uh, various time series averages, and a count of observations with visibilities that are 100 miles equal to 100 miles or greater. All right, so prevailing visibility. What is prevailing visibility? So prevailing visibility is the greatest distance that can be seen throughout at least half of the horizon circle. So if your half of the horizon is one, that's going to be your prevailing visibility. So prevailing visibility we had in digital format starting in 2009. Prior to that, it's all on paper format. Um, and digital format makes it really easy to uh, map and analyze using computer paper. We'd have to go back and put it into digital digitally. So lowest visibility. Now lowest visibility is an interesting uh, feature that we have that we report, and it is identified as the lowest prevailing visibility, which occurred during the past hour. And one interesting feature to know, which might be a little hard to see, but in those two red circles in that top one, you will see a zero and a one sixteenth. However, corresponding right below in a different form, you will, two, you will see two zeros. Now, because of that, the lowest visibility for those two hours is zero, even though we have a prevailing visibility of 1 16th of a mile. So why is that important? 
we wanted to know that because we only had so many years of prevailing visibility. So we really wanted to use this lowest uh, visibility data set. And in doing so, we first looked at prevailing visibility and their seasonal averages. So we broke them down into December, January, February, March, April, May, January, I mean, uh, June, July, August, and September, October, and November, and then annually, and then for the years. Now, as you can see, June, July, and August have the lowest visibility. September, October, November have the highest visibility. And we didn't really see any kind of difference due to COVID. And as you can actually see, um, the visibility in March, April, May was less than the average. Um, and the rest, and including September, October, and November, but the rest of them are all around the same. And this is what it looks like in chart format. <laughs> Pretty pictures. This is my favorite because this really pulls it in. So the red is June, July, August, and you can see how that's really below everything else for between 20 and 30 miles. But the rest of them, December, January, February, March, April, May, and September, October, and November, are all kind of around the same, but we can't really see a trend here. This is only 11 years. There's not really much to see. All right, so in comparing our prevailing visibility and lowest visibility, we had to figure out what the difference was to see if we could use lowest visibility. And it turns out that the lowest prevailing, the lowest visibility and prevailing visibility actually have a very similar average difference throughout the entire 11 years, an average difference of four miles. So again, now let's look at this on a chart, see what that looks like. Hmm. That looks pretty close to similar. So what this showed us is that we could use lowest visibility in order to see if there are trends in our visibility. So we went and pulled monthly averages from our lowest visibility going back to 1943. And the reason why I say 1943 is because if we look towards the left of this, go back in here, this little dip right there, if we look at that, those are null values. So we actually had some periods where we don't have data for certain days or certain months prior to 1943. So that's why this project is from 1943, where we do have a full data set. But as you can see, it is slightly apparent that we do have a rise in visibility, that we do have a rise in visibility throughout the entire record. Let me pull that in a little bit closer just so you can see that again. It's not much, but it does go from about 18 miles in 1941 up to about 28 miles currently. All right, so what does this look like in a seasonal average? So if we look at a seasonal average again, we can see that there's a slight increase in seasonal visibility beginning in the early 50s, kind of about right here. And we have a little trend to about right here. And then in the late 80s, early 90s into present day 2000s, it seems like that visibility has been increasing. But another interesting feature is that the divergence of June, July, and August is still lower. Possible increased water vapor. It is the summer. It does tend to be human. We're not sure. All right. So what we did, we wanted to see the variability, kind of look at the, statist the statistics of really what was going on in here. So in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and 90s, there's really not too much variability. So what this is a box and whisker plot. And really what we're looking at is this box is what we would consider uh, statistically significant with our low end and high end of our values. So this is a count of 100 of observations that we have seen 100 miles or greater. So we see a lot of observations where we could see 100 miles or more in the 40s and 50s. And then we really lose that variability in this time. But then it really jumps up in the 2000s and 2010s. Now, there's a lot of questions into why that happens. Um, and that is really where the metadata comes in handy. But 
for what this chart shows, we see a slight, a slight increase in seasonal visibility, again, beginning in the 50s, and then that divergence from before. All right. So hours of wind direction, as stated before, we had 46% of our entire wind, um, wind profile is from the west, with another 23% from the northwest. And I'll just pull that in a little bit closer so you can see. And I bring it back to this map where we could see before, because you can see how all these systems and our predominant systems really come through and how you can see our winds really come from the west and northwest. Now, this is where all this particulate matter and factors that would contribute into our visibility would come from. So future work, and this is where my portion of the presentation ends, but this is what we would like to do. We would like to see what the humidity levels and um, what the water vapor is doing in each of those seasons. We do have that data and we would like to get to that. Now, something that we do not have here at our elevation or location is air quality data, particulate matter around two and a half microns, which is about one ten thousandths of an inch. Um, and as you can see in this picture, it's really small. This is supposed to simulate a piece of hair. And then this right here, this little spot right here is what we would like to measure. And then again, in the boundary layer, and in the wind direction and visibility, do these have an effect on our visibility? And lastly, we would really like to digitize uh, our prevailing vis visibility just to corroborate and make sure there is no difference um, or a significant difference between our lowest visibility data set and our prevailing vis visibility data set. Okay, so that is the end of my presentation. If you do have questions, again, hold on to them, write them down, and we will get to them at the end. And uh, I think it's time for Mike. Are you ready? I am ready. Give me a moment to share my screen. Awesome. I'll close out and head it over to you then. Thank you for that great information, Jay. So we are also studying the visibility at Blue Hill Observatory, but in the context of some of the other parameters that we also measure. Specifically, the question we've been looking at is uh, looking at recent changes in sunshine duration that we've observed at Blue Hill, and how can we understand those changes in the context of visibility and air quality and cloud cover and other parameters. So I'll discuss a little bit how we measure sunshine and visibility at Blue Hill. And then we'll get into some of the data that we have from here and discuss how those parameters are related to each other. So for those of you who have not been to Blue Hill, here are a couple of photographs. Uh, one from its early years in 1885, shortly after it was built. You can see how barren the hill was in those days. And on the right is a more recent photograph. And you can see that the structure has changed quite a bit, though most of those changes came in the first 20 or 25 years of the, of the building's history. And uh, one of the other changes on the summit has been the growth of vegetation. And you can see some of that in this picture here. It's been encroaching on the summit. Uh, here you get a better view of some of the vegetation. Uh, this is a view from the top of the tower looking toward our instrument uh, enclosure that where we measure uh, temperature and uh, rainfall outdoors, and you can see the uh, vegetation that's encroaching on the, on the summit, though there's very little right on the summit itself. So like Ma Washington, we measure a large collection of parameters. Um, this is not even a complete list. There are even more than this, but we're gonna focus on the four that are colored in yellow here, sunshine duration, cloud cover, prevailing visibility, ozone amount. <clears throat> so to answer the question that Brian gave you earlier, we measure sunshine duration using a Campbell Stokes sunshine recorder. And the dates here, uh, there have been three used over the history of Blue Hill, and the dates here are the date in which uh, the first date at which each of the three has been used. So you'll see that one of them was in use for nearly a century. So this is uh, really one of the most continuous records that we keep at Blue Hill. 
And this photograph is of the modern uh, Campbell Stokes recorder. And it is a solid glass sphere that works like a magnifying glass and focuses the sunlight into a very small spot onto a paper card that is inside the metal frame under the glass sphere. And the paper card is at the focal length of the glass. So the light is focused into a very small hot spot that burns that card when the sun is above a constant intensity. I believe it's about 120 watts per meter squared. Um, and here I show you one example of a card from my partial sunshine day. Uh, so you can see that uh, while the sun goes across the sky, the burn mark moves across the card. So from this, we measure the duration of minutes in which the sun was, uh, was visible. And we know how many are possible from sunrise to sunset. So from that, we infer the percent of possible bright sunshine for the whole day for every month and then for every year. Here you can get a little bit of flavor for the in intensity of the sun's light, although we don't use that information from this. Uh, when the sun is very bright during the middle of the day near, near noon, the burn mark is very wide. And then towards sunset, as the sun gets dimmer and dimmer, the burn mark gets, gets fainter and fainter and fainter. So the answer that most of you gave to the question, a pyre heliometer, is similar, but that measures the intensity of the radiation, not the duration. So for visibility, we also use, are looking at the prevailing visibility. If we use the same definition that, that Jay gave you, uh, we record this uh, during three manual observations during the day at 7 a.m., 10 a.m., and 1 p.m. local time. And we estimate to a maximum of about 90 miles depending on the clarity of Graham and Adnock, which is one of the main mountains that we can see. Now, we've been observing prevailing visibility back to at least the middle 20th century, I believe. I think before that, in the early decades, they were just recording the mountains that were visible to them, uh, one of three that they would use. And then they would also include the, the clarity of that mountain on a scale of zero or three. So the three mountains that that they observed and we still observe today are Knobscott Hill in Framingham is about 20 miles to the west northwest. Wachusett Mountain is about 44 miles to the west northwest. And Ram and Adnock in Jaffrey, New Hampshire is 68 miles away from us to the northwest. And of course, there are many, many other markers that we use around the horizon to judge the prevailing visibility at other distances. So here are some views of uh, the horizon on uh, high visibility days from Blue Hill. On the left is a view of the city of Boston is about 10 miles due north of Great Blue Hill. So that's what it looks like on a very clear day. Uh, Ram and Ednock is seen in the picture at upper right. And from our vantage point, that is a very broad triangular shaped mountain, uh, not very large as it's nearly 70 miles away from us. Uh, this view I would estimate to be roughly uh, 70, 70, 70 or 75 miles estimating from that photograph. We can often see it be much clearer than that. And at times we can even distinguish the uh, tree line on Graham and Ednock and uh, in winter and snow on the summit. And when it's that clear, we'll estimate to 80 or 90 miles. And Mount Machusett is the third picture here, although that is closer uh, and not as tall as Graham and Adnock, it is, uh, appears a, a little bit larger than Graham and Adnock, and it's really the more prominent of the two hills for us. So on lower visibility days, there are a number of factors that can lower visibility. On the left here, I'm showing you a picture of a hazy summer day looking toward Boston. Uh, and you can see along the horizon that uh, brownish haze that's, uh, that's blocking the visibility, lowering the visibility. And that also has an uh, impact on the sunshine. As the sun is trying to rise through that, the sun is, sunlight is passing through more atmosphere, but it also has to pass through that aerosol, which lowers its intensity. So in other words, the sun would have to rise <clears throat> quite a bit higher in the sky for it to reach a high enough intensity to burn on the card. So that's why we get somewhat less sunshine duration on these lower visibility days. 
And of course, rainfall and fog conditions also will lower visibility. And we get those fairly frequently as well. We do occasionally even get an undercast at Blue Hill, which I know you get more often in Mount Washington. This is where we'll have a full fog deck that is below the, the summit level, and we can look down on the top of the fog. That's the picture on the lower right. So unlike the uh, modern digital horizon maps that uh, Jay showed you that can be produced today, we have something similar that was hand drawn for us over 100 years ago of the view from Blue Hill. And this is a sample of uh, those drawings looking northwest through north northwest. So in this view, you can see Kidder Mountain and Temple Mountain on the left and north and south pack in uh, southern New Hampshire and some of the other hills that are to the west and northwest of Boston. And to show you one more, this is a, a view toward the north, northeast and northeast looking toward Boston Harbor. And we can see all of the Boston Harbor Islands, uh, including Little Brewster Island, which I believe is this one that has Boston Light on it. It's about 14 miles away from us. And over here on the right, Wade, well, this the land mass is the North Shore going down, down toward Gloucester. And this land mass is Thatcher Island with its two lighthouses on it is about 40 miles away from us. So these are very valuable for new observers to learn all these different markers and their distances. So we get good consistent measurements of the prevailing visibility. And they're cool to look at. So for air quality, there are many ways to measure this. The Environmental Protection Agency or EPA has equipment on the summit of Blue Hill and that is this white shack that's on the summit in this photograph where they are measuring both the ozone concentration and the PM 2.5 that Jay mentioned. This is a particulate matter of 2.5 microns or smaller. Uh, the particulate matter measurement ended on Blue Hill at, in 2014, but the ozone measurement has, has, uh, is continuous, is uh, still running. So the ozone concentration uh, is often converted to what's called an air quality index for, for the public. And those are numbers that vary from zero for very clear air to over 300 for very hazardous conditions. Typically a bad summer day and ozone will uh, accumulate um, more in the summer and very stagnant, hot, low wind days. And typically those will be readings of around 100 or 150 around here in, in Boston. So that's, that's moderately unhelpful, getting very unhealthy. As for cloud cover, we also make a visual estimate of that by reading the fraction of the sky that is covered by clouds. And we manually observe this also three times per day by measuring the eighths of a sky that are covered by cloud, where zero is no cloud, zero is fully overcast. And our estimate represents a cumulative sky cover due to all of the cloud layers as viewed from upward from the surface. So for example, in this photograph that you can see, this is roughly six eighths of, of the sky that are covered by cloud. So let's get into some of the data. This is the plot of the annual mean bright sunshine plotted as a percent of the possible for every year. That is what I have plotted in black here. And then in blue and red are 10 year and 30 year running means that show you the data somewhat more smooth. So you can see the decadal variations and the longer term variations. So this is the question that we're posing here. Why are we seeing these large changes since the middle 20th century in the sunshine. These are similar plots for the winter sunshine on the top and for the summer sunshine below. So here too, we don't see any really long-term trend, uh, but we do see pretty large decadal variations. But the point here is that they are different between winter and summer, which implies that there are different factors in play between the two seasons in causing these changes in sunshine. So what are some of those factors? Well, here is the visibility plot from Blue Hill, at least for the data that we have tabulated so far. And this is only the visibility at 7 a.m. and only back to 1965. That is all, all we have digitized so far. 
But as you can see, this is a very dramatic increase in visibility from near 12 miles on average to more than 40 miles over the last 60 years or so. This was not a big surprise. I was expecting to see an increase, but not this large an increase. So it is a bit of a surprise that it's gone up this much. Uh, you note here that despite the large trend, there was a bit of an interruption in the 1990s to around 2000. Looking at the same data for winter and summer separately, winter is on the top, summer is on the bottom. We see this interruption around 2000 was much larger in the summer than it was in the winter. So whatever is causing that is something that is in play more during the summer and that may be uh, the air quality in this case. So moving on to air quality, these are plots that were made by the EPA of the data they observed at Blue Hill. This is the ozone concentration over the last 20 years uh, for Blue Hill. And here we do see a downward trend over this time period and a reduction in the highest value. So it really is uh, compressing here quite a bit. Uh, and so lower ozone amount correlates to improved air quality and higher visibility. So those are consistent with our visibility measurements. And I can point out here that it may not be a coincidence that 2020 has the lowest values here, given the conditions we've endured during the pandemic, uh, there being less traffic, less industrial activity is possibly contributing to the ozone coming down to this level. We will see if it continues to go down from here or if it comes up a little bit as we return to more normal conditions. So we also measure the aerosols or the particulate matter at Blue Hill, or at least we did through 2014. The Blue Hill trace is on the bottom here. And I don't really see too much of a trend here overall, though a bit of a reduction in the highest values. But a nearby station at Kenmore Square in Boston, this is more complete for the last uh, 20 years. And here we do see a nice downward trend. Um, in the particulate matter. And this also implies for improved air quality and higher visibility. So again, these are all consistent with each other and reinforce the higher visibilities that we're seeing at Blue Hill. So for cloud cover, this is what we see. And again, this is a visual estimate of cloud cover at uh, 7 a.m. Not too much of a trend here, but I note these anomalous years in the late 70s with uh, much lower cloud cover and then a, a bit of a recovery in more recent years. Look, separating these by winter and summer, we see larger variations from year to year as might be expected. Uh, and uh, there are decadal variations that are also somewhat different between the two seasons. So again, there may be different factors in play that are controlling how the cloud cover is, uh, is changing. <clears throat> So I thought what I would do is show these together just so we can discuss their relative uh, importance. So you've seen these plots before. This one on the right is the annual sunshine. The upper left is the visibility and the lower left is the cloud cover. So one thing that, one thing that stands out to me right away is this lower cloud cover period corresponds to this period of higher sunshine in the late, in the late 70s. So that does agree very well now, unfortunately, we don't have the cloud cover digitized yet for the early 60s. So we will see if there were low cloud cover conditions in those years that correlate to this high sunshine. Um, but if looking after that period where the sunshine, where the cloud cover came up again, you would expect there to be reduced sunshine somewhat, but that's not really what we see. So I think what's going on is that the increasing sunshine is more responding to the increasing visibility in those years. So in short, the sunshine is responding to both of these in complex ways that are overlapping. But I believe the cloud factor was dominant more in the middle 20th century and the visibility change is more dominant in the last couple of decades. So in summary, we've been investigating causes of recent decadal variations in sunshine at Blue Hill. We're looking at the contributions from changes in air quality, visibility, and cloud cover. We've seen significant increases in visibility at Blue Hill since the 1960s, which implies more sunshine. 
also seen improvements in the air quality over that time, which also implies more sunshine. So those are consistent. We do see strong cloud cover impacts on sunshine in the 1960s to 70s, but I think the impacts from cloud clouds are a little bit less in the decades since 2000. So this is a study that remains in progress. We're still digitizing some of the relevant data and we will look a little bit further back to see if these trends continue um, and, uh, and we'll look back at earlier decades. So I will conclude there by saying uh, Blue Hill and Mount Washington have a long history of, of working together on research projects of this sort. And uh, I'm happy to be continuing this tradition and I look forward to working more with uh, Mount Washington in the future. Well, I will leave it there and say thank you for listening and we'll take your questions. All right. Thank you so much, Mike. Thank you so much, Jay, as well. And Jay, thanks for turning your camera back on. Um, lots of interesting information. In fact, uh, a, a lot of data certainly being thrown your way this evening, everyone. Uh, but we got some great questions that are coming in. So I'd uh, love to kick things off and um, share some of the questions and comments we've been getting. And as a reminder, anyone joining on Zoom, use the Q&A button that you'll find down at the uh, the bottom center of your screen on the toolbar there, you can type in your questions as they come up. Uh, and on the Facebook live stream, certainly we'll try and get to any questions uh, later on this evening and tomorrow. Um, but the first one, I guess, right out the gate, and maybe I'll throw this uh, over to you, Mike. Uh, question from Bruce, and uh, talking about air quality, and Bruce asks, uh, in the days when smog dominated cities like Los Angeles, uh, was the East Coast also suffering from those same sorts of air quality impacts and would would those impacts have been seen at, at both observatories that we've been speaking about tonight? Yeah, I would say so. Uh, it's a little bit before my my time to well, I mean I was I was living in the area at that time, but not noticing it so much my personally. But yeah, there's there's no question that in the 1960s and 70s the air quality was lower uh, throughout the country. And I think that that's a leading contribution to the, the lower visibilities that they recorded at Blue Hill in those years. Yeah. And, and sort of uh, well, relatedly, another, another way um, that air quality and visibility can certainly be impacted is by wildfire. Um, and Christina had a question around that. You know, she was uh, asking basically, are you surprised? And Jay, actually, I'll throw this over to you first. And, and Mike, if you have um, anything to, to follow with, I'd appreciate it. Um, are you surprised that visibility over time is increasing with what seems like more and more wildfires every year? Um, would the smoke be funneled our way? Would we be able to see those sorts of things? I don't, Jay, what, what have you seen in terms of, you know, wildfires and impacts of visibility over at Mount Washington? Yeah, so um, we do see uh, haze and we do see smoke from wildfires, um, but because these are short-term events, they tend to not show up in long-term visibility trends and um, however it, it does it it does contribute to visibility um, a lot of the times with wildfires the particulate matter tends to be a little bigger uh, than what stays suspended in the atmosphere so a lot of times that will uh, get it'll descend and a lot of times those wildfires end up those particulate matters get really high up in the atmosphere. Um, so sometimes we can see it above us, sometimes we can see it below us. It, it really just depends where it is, what the flow of the atmosphere is at the time. Uh, but generally speaking, I would say those are shorter term events that uh, don't necessarily show up in a long-term study. Yeah, Jay gave a good answer that the, the local effects uh, on visibility will, are, will be uh, closer to the, the wildfire itself because of the larger particle size that drops out over distance. Um, one thing I could add, though, looking globally, is that, uh, burning that goes on, say, in the tropical rainforest and so on, does cause a, a lot of black carbon that becomes a, a global concern. Yes. It gets distributed around the world and it can land on polar areas that then melt the ice and so on. And so this is a big concern globally as well. Yeah, certainly with some of those large wildfires, I know there's some pretty incredible um, and maybe not so satisfying photos that are taken from the top of Mount Washington or Blue Hill where you can really see the um, just how connected uh, we are with other parts of the globe. Um, 
question here, and, and Mike would love for you to respond first, is from Becky. I know, and, and this is a good question because I know there's, you know, we've been talking about long-term records and, you know, the recording of essentially climate, looking at long-term trends, uh, average trends of, of weather conditions, but we're also talking about air quality as well. Um, and so Becky asks, you know, are we seeing more ground level ozone in the past several years? And is this due to climate change? And, you know, ultimately, how does this affect our visibility? And Mike, I know you, you spoke to this a, a little bit. Well, I'm not an expert in, in air quality and the measurements that we have only go back to about 2000. So to answer that question properly, we have to go back to any measurements that, that go back and really into the middle 20th century when we know the, the air pollution was much worse. I, I'd imagine that the ozone concentration will, would be much higher in, in those decades. So uh, that's something we can take a look at and maybe present to you in, in a future presentation. That'd be great. And, and sort of similarly, and, and Jay, I know this is something that um, we had pondered and early on in the investigations and you know what we might see in the data, but uh, Cynthia was asking, do you think the Clean Air Act and other regulations may have any impact on visibility? I know, you know we look largely at, at the data here, maybe not necessarily correlations and, and comparisons, but um, what are your thoughts around that? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's safe to hypothesize um, that that is a contributing factor. Um, and we would, you know, again, we, we would need to see that data. Um, it would be really helpful to see, you know, ozone at our level and elevation. Um, and to, yeah, to see what that data is. But it, I mean, you, you can't say that it doesn't. Um, the timing does line up giving our visibility trends, um, but seeing that data would certainly help corroborate that. Yeah, and certainly, and I know you you mentioned briefly uh, some air quality, obviously air quality measurement. These other parameters are being uh, measured by some other agencies. You know, at, at Blue Hill, the EPA is involved on Mount Washington, as far as I understand it, New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services does measure ozone and, and that data set is available. I, I'm assuming that's something that, you know, we'd, we'd love to take a look at for comparison's sake. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, if we have the opportunity to, that would be phenomenal. I would love to do that. And okay, well, here's a, a, a turn here, a little bit, a little more specific question from Janine. Uh, for Mike, how accurate is the Campbell Stokes Sunshine Recorder? Um, how would you sort of describe its accuracy and some of the things you've noticed? I mean, being one of the people yourselves who change out that card every once in a while and have examined a lot of that data. Yeah, well, as I mentioned, that's one of the most continuous recordings that we measure. It was literally used with the same instrument for nearly a century. Um, so how do you get more consistent than that, really? Um, the paper card is, is treated slightly so that it burns at a particular intensity. It doesn't ignite completely. Uh, so that has remained constant over all that time. The glass has remained uh, relatively constant and it remains naturally very clean. It gets clean uh, by the rain and, and by the observers. Uh, it doesn't move uh, at all. Um, so there's, there's really nothing to, to interfere with uh, the continuity of the Sunshine Record, really. Yeah, I just got to keep uh, ordering those paper cards, right? Yeah, yeah unfortunately, we still can. Yeah, that's great. Um, question uh, I have for both of you, but Jay, if you could respond first. It's a question from David, and I know it's both of you spoke to this a little bit because it was sort of the impetus, uh, real, I mean, at least from the observatory side of things. You know, the public came to us saying, hey, you know, what's going on with visibility with the with the pandemic and sort of a global shutdown, is the visibility improving? Um, David asks uh, more generally, you know, what significant effects uh, did did we see in the data, both on Mount Washington and, and Mike, if you follow up, um, just reiterating some of the things that you saw as well from Blue Hill. Uh, yeah, so um, like I said in the presentation, we here at the Mount Washington Observatory mm -hmm. didn't really see too much of a difference in comparison to years prior. Um, however, we are at a level in the atmosphere where the flow of, of the atmosphere is different than it is at the surface. So we have much higher wind speeds um, and our flow, it, it's, it, it's called the boundary layer. And within this boundary layer is where most of our weather happens. And the summit is sometimes above the boundary layer and sometimes below it. Um, so depending on 
where the summit was in the boundary layer during this, uh, this previous year um, would be dependent on what we saw. Uh, but generally speaking, we here at the observatory didn't see much of a difference. Yeah, similar answer at Blue Hill. We were already on such a strong upward trend that it might be difficult to see any, any small uh, further bump from the pandemic. But uh, the data I presented, and I think Jay presented, were, were annual means. Uh, perhaps they could be looked at in a little more detail to look at the actual uh, daily values to see if there are uh, more small scale uh, changes in the last couple of years. Yeah, certainly. I can recall my initial reaction when we were getting that question. And I mean, it was April, May of last year, you know, infancy of the, the pandemic and, and thinking, how would we even investigate this? We'll, we need, we need a lot of data. We need, we need a long-term record to be able to investigate this question because it could look low today or look high today, but what does that mean in the, the longer term comparison for sure? Mm -hmm. um, and so Sarah asked an interesting question, one that I know, I, I think shows up in, in both data sets and, and one that, um, left, you know, Jay pretty curious, and I'm sure you as well, Mike, there seemed to be an upward bounce, an increase uh, in visibility starting around the year 2000. I, that showed up in a couple data sets here. Any thoughts around, you know, what, what that's all about? Why the, maybe a little bit of a pause, but certainly a, a pretty steady increase from the 2000s and onward. And sorry, I, Jay, well, why, don't you, why don't you take a shot at that? <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, that's a really good question. And I, I wish I could give you a, um, a solid answer. Um, but unfortunately, we just we, we don't necessarily know yet. Um, we can come up with a lot of ideas. Um, however, it's just conjecture and hypothesis at this point. <laughs> uh, yeah, similar answer here. Uh, we really need to look at it in a little bit more detail to, to be able to answer that. And what are the, what's the what sort of data would you like to get your hands on, or who are the folks that you would love to you know support that sort of investigation? What would you need to know, Mike? That's, well, that's a good question. That's a, that's a question we have to answer. <laughs> Perhaps other, other information about uh, air quality might might be useful, or sunshine recordings at other sites. We should we should throw Sorry. in as well. Yeah, I mean, the, the so, more data that we have, uh, the better that we can answer these questions. And really, we need this data across multiple stations and multiple multiple elevations, um, and then coalesce it together. And like we are here with Blue Hill and Mount Washington, but that needs to be done on a regional and, and national scale, at least in the US. Certainly. Uh, well, here's a, we'll change things up just a little bit here. And uh, this is a great question, perhaps for you, Jay. Uh, Betsy would love to know, could you discuss the importance of keeping observations, uh, keeping observations, um, excuse me, I'll read this verbatim and see if we can translate a little bit, but can you discuss the importance of keeping observations despite our opportunities for sensors to augment our human capacity? So essentially, we could we automate automate Mount Washington? Could we automate Blue Hill Observatory? In fact, I know a little bit of that. You know, separately is 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 done. But what are the what's the value of continuing these uh, human powered or observed observations? Mike, I don't know if you or excuse me, Jay, if you can speak to that first. Yeah, uh, sure. So I mean, up on Mount Washington, obviously, uh, we face conditions here that you can't automatically just fix like our rhyming conditions and so forth. Um, but even, even just looking at our temperatures, right? So we use a sling psychrometer, which we've used here for a long time. Um, but even our, in our thermo shack, there's little things that happen um, that sometimes need to be checked by humans um, just to make sure that things are consistent. So sometimes like in our thermo shack, the temperatures may rise above because there's not enough airflow through it. Um, and you may get temperatures that are reading much higher than what the actual air temperature is, or vice versa. You may get cold air that gets locked inside the thermoshack because it's completely iced over and that air can't get out. Um, so it's really important to have that human intervention to make sure that our automated systems are working correctly. Yeah, that's a good answer, Jay. Um, so I agree that some of our parameters could be automated, but very often, 
the sensors that it used by automated equipment are very different from the ones we use manually. And so that would introduce discontinuities in the record that really would complicate you know, interpreting the climate record. Um, so we have to consider that as well. We really want to continue the, the continuity of the manual record intentionally because that's the way they've been doing it for 100 years. And that adds a lot of value to the climate record when you look at it over a longer time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, and Jay, to that point, I know when uh, early on when uh, you and uh, Sam and our other observers were taking a look at some of the background data, the metadata about how you know, vis visibility was measured over time on the mountain to kind of seek out any of those discontinuities or, or changes. Uh, what were some of the things that you discovered there or, or what you were ultimately sort of investigating to assess, you know, the consistency of this record? Yeah, I mean, it's even in the method of reporting, um, you know, we, we find a lot of times in data sets, timing is a big issue. Um, but also, you, you want to see continuity between your maps that you're using. Uh, sometimes the measurements between distances could have been different, say, in the late 1800s um, than they were now. Now, obviously, we did not face that here at the observatory. Um, at the Mount Washington Observatory, but those are things that happen. Um, as far as metadata and things that we ran into here, fortunately, because the way we measure visibility has always been the same way uh, through this human uh, visual, um, we've been pretty consistent. Um, but as you saw in that Bo Boxton Whisker plot, there was a lot of, there wasn't much variability between the 40s 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, so, you know, there could be something there that we haven't seen yet in the metadata, um, which is why we need to keep looking at it and continue to keep digging up whatever we can um, in order to, I mean, because just because we see something now, that data could also show us something in the future that is different. And, and to that end, and this is a question that it, um come up and, and one that I had as well early on when, you know, sort of posing some of this investigative work. Uh, Lawrence asks, uh, how many other weather stations throughout the country had similar observations about visibility and air quality? What did you find in the literature? Were you finding other, um, you know, 60 plus year visibility da data sets? Uh, I did not find much. Um, a lot of them were, I mean, there are good visibility data sets, but none to the distances that we can see here. Um, I did find a couple in Korea, <laughs> uh, surprisingly, um, up in the mountains there that they had, uh, not nearly as far back as we have. Um, but yeah, it, it's interesting because we have such a long visibility record, but they do do them in national parks. Um, I know when I was at Mount Rainier, they did it. Uh, they do it in the Great Smoky Mountains. Um, but to the extent that we do it, um, a lot of the time, so we do it because we give our data to the National Weather Service. And prior to that, we had um, observers here continuing that. Um, but yeah, I'm, I didn't find too many stations in the US that were similar to at least the Mount Washington Observatory or Blue Hill Observatory. Um, I could be false though. Mike, did you find any? I can't say I looked through the literature for other visibility data at this point, uh, but we could look into uh, what NOAA has for other stations around the country. Yeah. Yeah. And those, again, those NOAA stations, I mean, it, it, these are um, pretty unique stations, I would think, um, in our findings. So it would be interesting to see what other stations, maybe uh, in Colorado or Washington um, or California, I'm sure California probably has many visibility. Uh, stations somewhere. Yeah, sure. Yeah. All righty. Well, I think I might just have one more question for both of you, and it's a great one from Jillian, and, and one that I'm sort of curious about as well. Is um, Jay, uh, Jay, if you could answer first, uh, what are the priorities in terms of additional data you'd like to gather? What are the big questions that you're sort of left with here? What are you really curious about having um, done this sort of initial exploration and analysis of this data? <clears throat> um, from my point of view, I'm really interested in what, so we're looking at visibility, right? And what is in the air that limits our visibility? What is in the air that allows us to see less or see farther? Um, so that really comes down to 
the gases and particulates that are in there. So I re would really, really love to have some sort of some sort of recording device up here or have access to the ozone data uh, that new, the state of New Hampshire has. Um, uh, yeah, any sort of data of any kind of air quality data is, would be the top of my priority list. <laughs> and Mike, what, what about you? Yeah, specifically to visibility, uh, even better measurements of the air quality, uh, other, other uh, particulates and, and that so, uh, and so on uh, might, would be useful to the visibility project. But uh, in general, we're not just here observing the weather, right? We're here to observe a climate and the longer term changes of the climate. So the continuity of the records is, is really critical to be able to do that carefully. So that is what is unique about Mount Washington and Blue Hill. We're continuing these very long climate records and that gives us a lot of valuable information to study these climate changes over, over the long term. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks so much to both of you, Mike, Jay. I really appreciate you both taking the time to, to put together uh, some of your findings here and uh, letting everyone know a little bit more about uh, the long-term records and the, the treasure trove of data that exists at, at both of uh, these institutions. Uh, really appreciate all of you for joining this evening. Uh, if you enjoyed tonight's program, certainly would uh, strongly encourage you to uh, go over to mountwashington.org to donate to help support programs like this. Go over, check out bluehill.org as well. Uh, both institutions, nonprofits uh, that are uh, continuing some of the longest weather, weather and climate records in North America right now. So um, go on over to mountwashington.org uh, and take a look uh, at our upcoming programs as well. Uh, for those of you uh, who will be interested, next, next month, Tuesday, July 13th at 7 p.m., we will have former observatory weather observer and current assistant professor at the University of Nevada, uh, Nevada Reno. Uh, Dr. Neil LaRoe will be joining us to share about the science of fire weather, and he'll be uh, helping us understand uh, not only the conditions that help fires grow, but also weather generated by fires, including things like pyro tornadoes. So, uh, don't forget to register for those programs and to watch any previous programs you may have missed over at mountwashington.org slash SITM. All right. Thanks again, Mike. Thanks, Jay. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thank you, Jay. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mike.